It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. Episode 30 here today in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. I am your host, always alongside behind the scenes, our creator, producer, and director is J.R. Quitman. Well, again, before we get to our guests, as we have two of them here for episode 30, we do want to remind you to subscribe and like our channel. Make sure you do not miss out on any of our upcoming episodes. Well, again, as mentioned, it is two guests today for episode 30. It's a big show. Bob Ryan from the Boston Globe and ESPN and Bill Chuck, his co-author of a new book coming out, actually out right now. It's In Scoring Position by Triumph Books, all about him scoring baseball games and some of the oddities and some of the games that he has been scoring since 1977. A great book to read, great guest to have on our show here today. It is episode 30 featuring Bob Ryan and Bill Chuck. Well, guys, first of all, thanks for joining us here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to have both of you on. The first time we've had two guests on at the same time, and, and we're going to talk a lot about uh, the new book that both of you guys wrote, In Scoring Position. Obviously, we're in the middle of baseball season right now, but before we get to the book, I want to get to both of you guys' background, how you guys got together, and and Bob, we'll start with you, uh, a New Jersey guy born in Trenton back in 1946, but uh, you're best known for your time really in, in Boston. What was it like for you growing up and, and sports? How much were sports a part of, you know, the what you are all about? What, what, I'm about, about? To say, what I'm about to say is not hyperbole. It is gospel. Are you ready? Sure. I do not remember a time in my early life in which we were not at a game going to a game or getting ready to go to a game. Uh, my father was involved in, in sports and in different capacities in terms of uh, promotion, marketing, um, public relations, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and, and that involved a minor league baseball team in the late forties, the Trenton Giants of the then class B interstate league, Giants affiliate. And then later involved um, at being assistant athletic director at Villanova when I was six to eight years old. And we would, I would wake up in those early 50s uh, a year and on a Sunday morning and we'd say, hey, we're going to Polo Grounds today. Or we're going to, we're going to at first Shy Park and then uh, Connie Mack Stadium today. Right. And, and that's the way I lived. And I, I don't remember ever not having sports. Sports have been the number one dominant thing in my early life. And so that, that's the DNA was implanted from, from my father. That, that's the way I lived. How much were you, were you playing sports at that time? I, I was a normal kid. We lived in a classic old fashioned neighborhood with lots of kids and, 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 and spaces in which to play. And, and we were, did everything seasonal and included the backboard. There was a backboard out behind our house as well. So we always were able to play basketball. We played all forms of baseball, everything from one-on-one, -on -one, which we called swift pitching, uh, batting one-on-one -on -one against the garage as a backstop. There were garages all around. And, and then if we had, you know, depending on how many people we had, we played different forms of baseball, including actually playing hardball on a diamond, which was two blocks away when we had enough people to war warrant that. And we played touch football in season. Uh, you know, we played all the kids games. But my difference was that in addition to playing, I was a huge reader and I love reading. And I, I, I always say that I always remember uh, he would take me to a high school basketball game on a Friday night. And I couldn't wait till Saturday morning to read about the game because it wasn't validated in my mind until I read about it. And and I was also, I like to say, the only eight year old on the block who knew what the infield fly rule was. <laughs> and, and so that differentiated, dif, dif, you know, differentiated me from the other kids. I broadcast baseball. I still don't know that rule. Uh, <laughs> Bill, your, your background, you were born and raised in, in Manhattan. Sports, how much were they ingrained in you at a young age? Well, uh, first of all, don't you just love listening to Bob even just tell a story about his childhood? Uh, uh, I grew up in Manhattan, which, uh, uh, you know, is this kind of city area. But uh, so I didn't I didn't have the fields of uh, uh, I, I would only have fields of dreams. And but we played punch ball. Uh, I'm I, in Stuyvesant Town, where I grew up, is famous for its various playgrounds. And uh, uh, you know, we uh, playground ten were as good as uh, anybody when it came to punch ball. I had hurt my knee 
playing football when I was 12. And just so that you know, I don't want to mislead you in any fashion. When we were playing touch football, I reached up to catch the ball and I collapsed. Nobody was around me. Nobody touched me. Nothing happened. I just fell and tore my cartilage in my right knee. And that was the end of my baseball and football playing career, which really was a blessing for me because as I was telling somebody the other day, uh, when I was very young, I dreamt of playing second base for the Yankees. I wanted to be the next second baseman. And, uh, and so this person said to me, oh, it must have been so sad when you tore your cartilage and couldn't play anymore. I said, well, I consider it looking at that glass half ball a blessing because I couldn't hit. I was too short. I was too small. And this way avoided all the indignity of learning later that I would never play second base. But so at that point, from that point on, I managed the punch ball team and uh, I dreamt of being a a baseball announcer. And uh, for me, uh, 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 we didn't have very much money. We had a black and white TV. And I remember being taken to a game in 1960, which was, I'm guessing by looking at you about 70 years before you were born, but, um, uh, and, uh, at, at Yankee Stadium. And uh, first of all, uh, just seeing the majesty of a ballpark. But understand the reason why I mentioned that we had a black and white TV was I'd never seen baseball in color. And when you walk out and you see a baseball field, it's just simply the most thrilling thing that you could possibly imagine. I mean, my whole world changed just by walking from the concourse into into our seats way up high. It didn't matter to me. I got to see that green. I got to see Terry Francona's father play in the first game that I ever went to. And just to see it, it was was amazing. And my father, uh, uh, as I start the book, my parents were old when I was born. And uh, I, I don't mean to, uh, uh, to, it sounds like a joke, but uh, when I was born, they were in their early 40s. And at that time, it was old. And so, uh, but he would tell me stories about seeing Mel Ott play, about Carl Hubble, whose arm was twisted to the side by throwing a screwball. So he taught me baseball and I fell in love with it. Oh. Yeah, I think a lot of people share that kind of story. Jim Cotton, one of our previous guests, a similar thing about going to the game and just seeing the colors and, and how amazing it was. Bob, so, so you grew up in New Jersey. You go to uh, Boston College, uh, 1964 to 1968. What was that like for you, you know, going from Jersey to, to the Boston area? First of all, I got to back up and say just that that story that Bill told has been told by thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, their experience. I don't have that story. I could not possibly tell you what was the first time I went to a ballpark a, I just, because I just explained to you, that's all I ever did. Okay, now, uh, the transformation to Boston, um, a great sports town. And the first thing I made sure I did when I got in town was to go to the Boston Garden, make a pilgrimage to the garden. You know, I was not a Celtic fan. In fact, I rooted for the 76ers. I was, in fact, I was an anti-Celtic guy but I wanted to go to the garden. And actually I got there first to see the Bruins play because of the schedule they played before the Celtics. So I saw the uh, early, early games, uh, opening night in 1964 was uh, my first visit to the Celtic game. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, first, and that was, but I uh, saw so that. Um, Boston uh, turned out to be a great place, you know, the perfect place for me. It was sports minded town uh, and, and, and great newspaper town. Uh, at the time there were still, there were three newspapers, each had a morning and an evening. So it's, in its essence, there were six papers to read every day and uh, that was uh, that was a pleasure so uh, I, I fell in love with Boston and uh, I, I was very very comfortable you know of course it's uh, BC uh, you know I, I right away the first athletic event I ever saw at BC I covered the, their opening football game in 64 was against Syracuse and it just so happened that it was the collegiate debut of Floyd Little and I had been a copy boy at the Trenton Times in that summer and uh, I had done a little writing for them and Floyd Little had gone to Bordentown Military Institute 
uh, that's where he went before he went to Syracuse. So they had me cover the game. So the first BC game I ever saw, I actually worked from the press box and covered. And um, that was the beginning of my Boston College, uh, uh, you know, uh, career. And I later, I worked for the school paper for three years and I was the play-by-play -play basketball broadcaster for, for all four years. But you were a history major. Did, did they not have broadcasting or journalism at that time? Did you? I was strangely advised, when, when you go to a prep school such as I did, Lawrenceville School, which was the most important academic uh, a, a, a thing that happened to me that changed my life. Um, your, your career night, we had a career night, right? You got the editor of the Wall Street Journal, you got an editor from Newsweek, you don't have, you know, you got some high powered people. And I was this, I mean, I have to say it in all total immodesty, I was the star of the school paper, all right? And, and I was the guy, and I was the sports editor of the paper. I also played basketball, I was also the football manager. I was the sports guy of the, of the class, all right? But I was specifically, I was the, 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 the most prominent person on the school paper. And they advised me, you don't have to go to journalism school. In fact, they advised against it. Go get a liberal arts education, work for your school paper. If you get an opportunity to write a work on your local paper in the office, you know, at home as well, that's great, which is exactly, you know, what I had done. I had been, a, a, that summer had been a, a copy boy at the Times, Trenton Times. Anyway, uh, so I majored, and I, my original major was English. But at the end of the first year, when the electives, I had to choose what I was going to do for my sophomore year, I said, I don't want Chaucer. And that was pretty much the killer right there. That was like the that was like the inning ending double play for me. The six four three was I don't want to do Chaucer. So um, I said no. I switched to history because it's about reading and writing, which is what I was all about, reading and writing. And it turned out to be the perfect choice. A because I like it, liked it. I, I love history. And B, it it, it was a piece of cake for me to get through history, and that's what my degree is in history. Yeah, and I'm sure it's probably helped you in your writing as, as well, just uh, history and knowing some backgrounds and some different things that I'm sure you, you've woven into some of your stories. Bill, for you, you went to American University, you uh, majored in psychology, and, and eventually became an English teacher, went into writing. Uh, what led to, you know, the, the transition into writing and, and that as your background? You're awfully good, I got to tell you. So, so here's the deal. Um, I went to American University. Uh, okay, remember, let's go back to me hurting my knee, wanting mm -hmm. to be a broadcaster, you know? So I go to American University planning to be a broadcast journalism major. Uh, and uh, I, I was working on the radio station the entire time. While uh, I went from uh, uh, the time that Bob graduated, he graduated in 68, I started in 68. And uh, uh, went till uh, 1972. Now I was in Washington, D.C. And uh, I know, again, I don't mean to, you know, bring up the fact that I'm older than dirt and you're very young, but in Washington from 68 to 72, all hell was breaking loose. And uh, I did a lot of newscasting there and I got to be, um, uh, I, I, I was, um, uh, fortunate enough to be one of the people who would get to interview people like Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and a lot of the other members of uh, the Chicago seven. And, uh, and that was my role in, in uh, broadcasting there. And I did, uh, I, I did color for the uh, basketball games and we had, did, I didn't have much of a, a baseball team. I did play by play the first game that I, I, I'm doing it. I became a boxing announcer because the guy slid into third, got up, punched the guy, the third baseman in the face. And the next thing you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing uh, punch by punch coverage. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I knew I knew to be a writer. First of all, I became a psychology major because at one point during my sophomore year, the uh, advisor called me in and said, you know, since we got rid of the broadcast journalism major here, you have to major in something. <laughs> so I said, oh, uh, yeah. and I said, do I have a lot of courses in anything? He said, uh, she said to me, well, you've taken a lot of psychology courses. I said, I'm a psych major. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's how I became a psychology major. But um, uh I had never been encouraged to write because my handwriting was so bad. And so it's only in college when I started typing things uh, that I got any encouragement in my writing and I was encouraged 
a lot from that point on. But, you know, in 1973, I was still in New York City. Uh, New York was going broke. I didn't know what to do. Uh, we were in a major recession. And so I became, you know, what do you do when you don't know what to do? I became a teacher. <laughs> and, and I said to my aunt, who was a teacher for many years, I said, I don't know how to teach. She said, stay a chapter ahead of your class. So uh, that was my background until, um, uh, until I moved up to Boston in 78 uh, uh, and uh, started the academic support program at Emerson College. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, things evolved, truly evolved from there. I was on television uh, where I was known as the czar of entertainment. <laughs> where, where I would give movie re movie reviews and uh, uh, and and uh, interview uh, celebrities. My big thrill was when the circus came to town. I rode an elephant through downtown Boston. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you something. Bob Ryan's done everything. He has not ridden an elephant through downtown Boston. This is very true. But um, <laughs> uh, but you know it. Uh, uh, things evolve. I've seen some elephants in wombs, but I've never written them. <laughs> right. right. You, you've right. written the, about some of those elephants in the room, right? Yeah. Yes. You know, you, days of the Boston Globe, Bob, for you, 1969, you start there, and you're on the, the Celtics beat. As you said, you, you weren't a Celtics fan. You were a 76ers yeah. fan. But what was that like, the early days of, of you know, your days of the Globe? The first time that I ever rooted for them was the 69 finals, okay? By that time, I had been in Boston. I, I had been at the Globe as a summer intern in 68. I had to go on active duty in the reserves on the, over the winter. Oh, Bob, 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 stop for a second. Tell them who, who, who you oh, shared the first day with. Well, on June 10th, 1968, I walked into the Globe to start my summer internship, and uh, there were two other uh, sports interns. One's name was David Martin, who had gone to Yale, and I do not know whatever happened to him. He was blonde and rich, so I suppose he's done all right. And the other was a guy named Peter Gammons, who was a fellow preppy who had gone to Groton and then North Carolina. He was a Tar Heel. And uh, we hit it off rather quickly and uh, remain, remain friends to this day. And uh, so, yeah, that was kind of a quite, I think, the Globe. Two Hall of Famers starting on the same day. Yeah, that was uh, it, it, impressive. It was, That's impressive. I love we, we love we both love telling that story. But it's a, and. Our first story was a joint byline that that never happened again. Uh, it, it what happened it was the weekend following the Robert the Bobby Kennedy assassination, and our job was to this is the old days before internet before you know we had to to canvas the uh, the um, uh, reaction of other newspapers around the country to the fact that baseball chose to play that weekend. And there were certain players who actually boycotted. I think Rusty Staub was one of them and that didn't want to play in honor and respect out of, of what had happened, but baseball played. And so our job was to call up on the old telephone around the country. Hey, did your columnist write about this or did you editorialize about this? And then we put the stories together and it was a joint byline by mm -hmm. Peter Gammons and Robert Ryan. Uh, and I went to them and said, please, I'd like to be Bob. And that was the one and only time I was ever Robert Ryan in the pages of the Boston Globe. But that's how Peter and I got started with a joint byline story on the first day at work. And all those years, you just retired in, in 2012. You're doing other things, obviously. You still do some writing for the Globe here and there? I write every other Sunday, as a rule. And uh, I started out, and after, when I did retire in 2012, the, uh, the, the sports editor, Joe Sullivan, and I had an agreement, verbal agreement, that I would write, quote, 30 to 40 Sundays a year, which I did for several years. Joe retired, and uh, his, sub, his um, successor, Matt Pepin, uh, has, uh, you know, he, he altered the arrangement which is fine. They had every right to do that to every other Sunday. It still keeps me active. And, uh, and, and I, okay, I think it's worked out well for both parties. And you're doing a lot of work, obviously, now on ESPN, where a lot of people see you and, and, and you know you more for your, your time on TV. Than oh, of course. Well, anybody under 40 or maybe even 50 knows me far more, to, unless you're from Boston, knows me far more, only from television, not from writing, of course. And um, I, I, for, there was a period of time I was very active with, I was uh, a full-time member of the sports reporters on Sunday mornings for 28 years. That show ended in May of 2017. I was a fill-in summer replacement for, for the Kornheiser and, uh, and Wilbon on, uh, on PTI. Uh, and then um, I, I was a charter member uh, of uh, original cast member, as I like to say, of sports of, of uh, Around the Horn 
and I still am a member of the cast of Around the Horn. I do, I, I do it every other week. So, but I'm just down to that one television thing now. Every and I had done local NBC Sports Boston for many years doing things. So at one point I was really had a loaded calendar, but now it just comes down to uh, you know the every other week, the every other week, and and uh, and uh, whatever uh, whatever comes up. And, and wait, wait, tell Bob, Bob, tell Mike uh, what your official title now is for the. Well, I, I dub myself the sports columnist emeritus of the Boston Globe, yeah. and I, I and so you know I, that's my own designation, and they're buying it. They're they're going along with it. Let's go back to sports reporters for a second with with Dick Shap that that kind of started that. I mean, was that kind of the first show where you saw you know print guys? on tv no they, the pioneers were the the sports reporters on tv that name of the show in chicago i'm sure bill remembers that group the smoke literally smoke filled big, room big cigars they all these guys were sitting bill, around bill, a table bill smoking gleason, cigars uh gleason and and and, uh, the, the, and the kid was rick tellender he was the little young youngster he was a you know quote unquote um ben bentley was the host he was a character and uh, they 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 were the ones who got it rolling, and I'm sure that the format uh, uh, was borrowed from them when when Terry O'Neill, the award winning uh, Emmy award winning producer, created the Sports Reporters for ESPN in in '88, and he sold the rights to Joe Valerio, an old friend, a friend of mine from the New York Post days of, of the '70s, and who ran the show for the next 28 years. And it was when he took over that I got involved, and I always like to say this is how. It is truly the, one of the things when you speak to kids and, you know, the, the, I say, I hate to tell you, but it is true. It, it ain't what you know, it's who you know. And, and you, you know, you better bring something to the table when you, but if someone else had taken over that show, he would have brought in his friends, old friends. Well, Joe Valerio tapped his old friends, which I was one of them and led to a wonderful 28. And that really got me, in, in, you know, in, in the in ESPN door for other things to happen as a result of the sports reporters. Well, Bill, let's, uh, let's talk about this team, th this book here, and, uh, you know, what brought you guys together? Who, whose idea was this, and, uh, you know, who brought this to the table? Okay, so um, here's what I want to tell you. <laughs> uh, Bob and I, uh, I uh, Bob, it's fair for me to say we've grown very close over the last couple of years, wouldn't you say? Yes, I mean, we talk to each other two, three times a week or when anything cool comes up that the other person would like. And uh, we don't limit it to, uh, uh, to, to baseball. If uh, Please do not get us started on old television and Dobie Gillis. But, <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is that, um, uh, that uh, we agree on just about everything. There is a slight variation of the origin story of the book. Here's the story. <laughs> uh, uh, I was very, very sick with COVID in uh, March of 2020. I was an early adopter to the program. And um, uh, for uh, three months, I could barely get out of bed. I ran a fever for 23 straight days, 104, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. And I am... Uh, you know, if it were not for the wonderful care of my neighbors, I would not be here today. So I, I finally start coming around. And so I, I'm wanting to resume my uh, looking at Twitter. I love Twitter because it for, for people who are involved in journalism, uh, there still is a great value to Twitter. And uh, I start... You know, I, I look a day here, I look a day there, and there's Bob talking on, uh, on May 6th, 1976. Here's what happened in the game, in the Red Sox game. Now, 76 was the sole year that Bob was the... Uh, Seven. 77 was the sole year that Bob was, was the, uh, the, the primary guy covering the Red Sox. So he's going through it because we've got no baseball. You know, COVID has shut down baseball. So Bob is giving us these moments. Now, uh, Bob and I had met initially through the late great columnist for the Globe, Nick Cafardo. I, I contributed to Nick for many years had a little spot at the bottom of his column called from the Bill Chuck files. 
and uh, uh, and Nick changed my life in that respect. And he was a tremendous friend, and he introduced me to many people, including Bob. But when I say introduced, I've met people online. I was I was doing a column called Billy Ball on Billy Ball Billy Hyphen Ball dot com every day, and just sending it out to media people. Uh, while I was continuing the rest of my uh, miserable marketing career. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're at, a, I'm at the ballpark one day. This is right. This is a few years before the book. And so my, my buddies uh, I'm with Alex and John, and they say, you know, Bob Ryan sits a few rows up from us here. I said, Oh my goodness. And I start, Honestly, my hands start sweating. Now I'm a grown man. I've been fortunate fortunate in my life to meet a lot of very cool people and I'm nervous. So I say, okay, I've got to meet them. And so I go upstairs, up the stairs of Fenway. I'm carrying my scorebook and uh, I interrupt Bob, I'm Bill Chuck. And, and he's very nice to me. And he says, oh, you keep score? I said, yeah, of course I keep score. And he goes, I've been keeping score for a million years. Abner Doubleday and I, no, he, he says for the last, you know, 30, 30 plus years, it was at that point, I've been keeping score of games and I keep all the score books in my closet. Well, I'm going to tell you something, you know, my, my fascination and love of Bob Ryan was enormous before that. And then I hear this, and this is spectacular to me. Okay, back to the back to the present of 2020. I know Bob's waiting for me. And <laughs> and so down. and so I I I get my strength up and I say, Bob, how are you? It's Bill Chuck. Oh, Bill, how are you? And I go through the whole COVID crap. And I say, I've got an idea. I think you've got a book writing about your scorecards. He says, what are you talking about? I said, and then I explained the concept. He says, I love this idea. This is terrific. Let's do it. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm a very insecure person. So anybody who immediately agrees with any of my ideas, I'm backing off on. Uh, now I'm giving not second thoughts, but third thoughts. I said, slow down a second, Bob. Just Let's just give it a little thought. Can you talk to somebody? He says, I'm having lunch with Dan Shaughnessy today. I'll ask Shaughnessy what he thinks. And a few hours later, Bob calls me up and says, Shaughnessy loves the idea. He's, he, offered, he offered his agent if my agent doesn't want to do it. And uh, let's get started. Now, Bob's recollection is a little different. Bob, Bob says, well, I wasn't sure when I heard the idea. I am telling you as a fact, I only wish I had it on tape. The man was so over the top with this idea. But uh, so in any case, uh, we started working on the book and uh, I'll let Bob uh, take it from there. Okay. Well, yeah, this, this is the 1977 book. Oh, wow. We started, okay. And um, Bill's correct that I was tweeting on a daily diary basis. I didn't cover all 162. I covered like 130 of the, you know, and it just so you know that 45 years ago today, uh, the Red Sox in Yankee Stadium beat the Yankees four to three. Um, the winning pitcher was Bill Lee, who went seven. Uh, Bill Campbell got the save, a two inning save. And the losing pitcher with a complete game, of course, was Ed Figueroa. Uh, uh, he, what was uh, the length of the game, Bob? L game time, 220. Oh, jeez. And... Um, Home runs by Evans and Hobson, and the the um, the winning run was uh, constructed in the eighth on a leadoff double by Butch Hobson, batting eighth, of course. Uh, bunted over to third. How about that? Imagine you were allowed to do that. There's Did you know bun. that? There's a bunt. There's the American that. League, right? American League by Danny Doyle. Danny Doyle, excuse me, and Danny Doyle. Danny Doyle, and then Danny Doyle. Uh, uh, Rick Burleson brought him home with a sacrifice fly to right with some guy named Jackson caught the ball, but was <laughs> unable to peg out the runner at the plate. Um, and so, um, you yeah, uh, that, 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 that's what happened on, on the 23rd of May in 1977. But this is the book that, the, that launched the, uh, the whole thing. There are nine of them in question. Uh, and the book includes 
uh, entries dating from 1977 up to uh, last year. We wanted to make sure that we got as recent as, as we could. And we have an entry from last year, a one from 2021. Uh, and um, um, that's, but these, these books, I have nine of them, they're, they're, uh, they're easy to carry around, easy to pack. I never truly, literally ever left home on a trip of any kind, personal or business, after baseball season started in all those years, because as Bill well knows, you never know when a baseball game is going to break out. <laughs> so you got to be ready. And I was always ready. So this started in 1977. Was it a professional thing or did it carry over to? Well, in 77, I covered the team. Right. You have a book, you know, and, and, and you naturally keep score every game as, as, a, as a writer. And I was so excited that year because it was my opportunity to cover baseball after seven years of covering basketball, which I loved. And it was, you know, it gave me my name in the book and launched my career. You know, and then, frankly, you know, I know that I'm always going to be associated with basketball and I have no problem with that, except that as I write in my introduction to the book, baseball was my mistress all those years, you know? And um, so, yeah. Uh, I, but what happened was when the next year when I was off the beat, uh, as, and I was a, any game I went to, I, I kept score. I just did because I wanted to, and, and I thought it was, and, and, and I kept that up and, and I can truthfully say, and I'll take the sodium pentothal, I'll take the lie detector test. I've scored every game at, and, and at every, every organized baseball game that I've been to since 1977. That year, I even scored every spring training game that I went to, which nobody does and which I never did again. But that's how excited I was to be involved in baseball, to get involved in baseball. And so uh, now I had scored games. This not, it's not like I, that was the, this wasn't the beginning of my scorekeeping career. It just meant the, this phase of it because I kept score. I have a book. I can't find a book with me. Yeah, overall, four, 1,400 games that you scored. Oh, okay, here we go. In your lifetime. I'm sure that's here, here, increasing as we talk, too. Here's the one that is one, for example, that one of the ones I would have before that and included in here as the 75 World Series, including the games that I didn't attend, I, I scored on television, which of course includes the, the world, the famous Louis Tion, 162 pitch complete game and, and, and which I have signed by Louis Tion. And uh, he signed it for me. And uh, so um, anyway, this is the kind of, this is score master book. Well, you know, uh, obviously for my purposes all these years, this size book was far preferable. But Mike, just to let you know, when, when, Bob says you never know when a game will break out. Bob hasn't just scored major league games. Oh no! Oh, there many variety. Minor, all kinds of minor. I, I, I've been. I counted up. Been to forty-four minor league parks over the years, and and um, you know the, there were several. When we get to volume two, Mike, we're, we're, we're going to get. I, there's Wait, a, there's but a there's more I than minor to, league. I, Come I, on, I'm. I'm, I'm the, I used to write infomercials. But there's more. <laughs> what else yeah, besides major stuff and in minor there, league? Well, one of the reasons of, do you take your book everywhere. In 1984, I was covering the Western Conference Finals of the NBA, the Suns and the Lakers. I was in Phoenix, and it just so happened that Arizona State was playing host to North Carolina as in, in a an arranged match. Both of them were going to Omaha for the College World Series, but they had a downtime in before they would get out there. And I don't know who called who, whether Jim Brock of Arizona State called Mike Roberts of Carolina or what, but they got together and here comes Carolina and they're playing Arizona State in this afternoon, beautiful sunny afternoon in June of 1984. I go to the game with book, of course. In that game were nine future major league players wow. and two future major league managers. Anybody we've heard of, Bob? Yes. Well, the leadoff man for, Carolina, for Arizona State was uh, Oda B. McDowell, who did hit a home run. Batting third and playing left field was a guy named Barry Bonds, who did not hit a home run, but much better for our purposes of he drew an intentional walk. <laughs> <laughs> with and, the bases loaded? Well, mm -hmm. it wasn't that. It, 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 was a, it was not with the bases loaded. No, that would have been, of course, even better. Uh, the two managers are leading off and catching for Carolina. Oh, it was a BJ Sirhoff wow. and batting second and playing short Walter Weiss was one of the two managers. And I have to say, if you can name the other manager to come out of this game, you really are a, a baseball scholar. I'll save you the trouble. It was Don Wakamatsu <laughs> for Arizona state and who later managed the Mariners. So, uh, but that's exhibit a of why you, you have to always but have also, to also Olympics, Bob. What I, about oh, the Olympics? I, I, I had uh, games in here from, I have, 
Cuba's first loss in the Olympics was to the Netherlands, wow. who were coached by an Arizona State coach named Jim uh, Pat Murphy. Uh, but I have that. Uh, I've got uh, uh, the the gold medal women's softball from 1996. <laughs> USA beats China on yeah. a home run by the doctor, uh, the shortstop. I forget her name. Doctor. She she was a medical student then, who's now the doctor. So I've got that, and I got a. So I got a couple other uh, Olympic games. Uh, I, oh, I definitely would take my, my book. You know, when they were having uh, Olympic baseball. Yeah. And so, so Mike, the process of writing the book was was like Bob would go through a book, and he would write down a game for us to discuss. Bob sees things that, that other people just don't see. He just does. I mean, that's uh, that to me is is the sign of, of of the greatness that he is, and 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 the great baseball writers and the great writers and great photographers. I was on a photography trip one time with people who were far superior photographers than I, and we were taking the pictures of the same things, and my pictures looked like. Uh, you know, uh, oh, oh, look, he took another cute snapshot. And these other people would take shots that were ma magnificent and they were the exact same things. Well, Bob would, Bob has a gift of seeing games and seeing things and noticing things and making sure that his readers would notice things that other people didn't do. So Bob would give me this list of games and then we would have Zoom meetings similar to this. And by the way, you you can be invited to another one if you'd like. <laughs> and and I would do, uh, I described it as Bob being the miner, M I N E R, who would dig up and find a nugget. And my job was to polish the gem and make it into something special by giving some historical, uh, or context or some anecdotal information to make it special. Well, here's the thing that Bill never mentions that I, that, that I have to stress is that uh, you would listen to what he just said and say, okay, he's a stat nerd, you know, it, it, he's, uh, Bill Chuck is an excellent writer. And the thing is this book, he, he has enhanced the, the whole process by, by his own prose as well. It's not just the information. The information is priceless. I mean, he digs up information as well as anyone can possibly do it. That's fine. He's a researcher, a non pharrell researcher, but he can also write. That's why it was such a, for, such a pleasure for me to to read what he would send back to me, you know, and and, and on top of it. So uh, it, the writing, if people think I can write, that's fine, but I want to let want people to know it's not just uh, Bob Ryan's prose that, that sings in here. It's Bill Chuck's as well. Yeah, I'm sure you helped put some of those you know, oddities, those rare events into some context and, and perspective for everybody with, with those stories. Bob, I want to know who taught you how to, to score a game? Because, you know, everybody scores games. Everybody's a little bit different. What, what's your influence on in scoring a game? You know, I, I, I've been asked this question and I don't have an answer. It's one of those things where I just happened. I had to learn from somebody. I don't, when my, my father passed away when I was 11 and, and I, uh, the, the father who implanted all this DNA in me, uh, but it, I, so it wasn't him, and I don't know. Now I had a friend in in, in college named Happy Fine who who was a uh, uh, loved to score, and we used to compare you know processes, you know, he, uh, and he we'd have arguments about how to how to note things, and you know because uh, and and uh, I, we played off each other a little bit. But honestly, I don't know. I just know I have firm opinions, you know, about things about the uh, you know, and one of the things drives me is the idea that there's any that a uh, called strike. Is a backward K. Period. Don't give me this K small C nonsense. <laughs> that some people, you know, that's ridiculous. That that's that. Anyway, but so so you you don't have anything that that signifies a, a strikeout looking as opposed to swinging. Back up, backward K. Okay. Backward. That's what a strikeout looking is, and nothing else. Okay. A backward K. But anyway, there's but there, everyone has a little different nuances, you know, that they have. And and uh, I I, I got to tell the story though. Bill knows it. Uh, uh, the, the, the greatest scorekeeping method of all time, of course, was Phil Rizzuto's, and which is that he had a thing called WW, wasn't watching. <laughs> <laughs> he had one more, H I W H. He intentionally walked him. <laughs> <laughs> but 
WW. I I I I don't have any WWs. Well, I have Bob, some of those you ever a, look it away sometimes calling a game as, as well. Go ahead, Bill. Bob. Were you ever an official scorer? No, um, I never was an official scorer. That that was a, a first of all that I only was on the beat the one year full time, you know, and uh, uh, you, you need more experience than that to even be considered to do it. Uh, uh, but no, I wasn't. Uh, I, that's a tough job. I I don't envy them that job at all. Uh, and, you know, whether it's a pass ball, wild pitch, or uh, it, this, or or the hit, or the hit ever. And uh, no, I, that's a, a thankless. Really, it's a, it's a very difficult and, and but and, and necessary but difficult job. I envy. I, I admire people that do it well. So again, you're scoring all these games in the book in scoring position, which is out now from Triumph Books, and and, and some of the rarities. I saw a couple of them listed there. The one I really liked was the hitting the cycle off of four different pitchers, which I guess maybe could happen more nowadays than, than it did. Yeah. Well, you know, well, back in 1978, when Andre Thornton did it against the Red Sox, I guarantee that it was very rare occasion. Yeah. I am. It has been diluted now. My my the rarity, because obviously it's very possible to have it happen now. It wasn't very possible up to 1970. So right up to what? Up to about four or five years ago. Yeah. It wasn't very possible. But yeah, that's fun. Um, we both have our favorites, uh, you know, oddities. And one of my favorites is um, uh, I'm, I'm and, and this this ties in with the idea that I try and tie a personal anecdote, you know, to flesh out the story. Um, at the press box, uh, uh, and um, they're playing the Orioles in the early 2000s, I think, and there's bases loaded, two outs in, in the middle of the game, and there's a chopper between the mound and, and, and the, home, the home plate in the mound. And the pitcher, his name is Eric Dubose, comes in, catches the ball, and keeps running, running right to home plate. Makes the put out of the plate. One unassisted, one U. Now, you get a one U at first base, sometimes but you don't get it at home plate i was rare and i, I i'm dazzled by this this just sends off rockets i stand up turn around and there sits gene michael the, the immortal stick everybody in baseball knew gene michael he was there scouting for the yankees or doing something i i don't say a word i look at him and he says i've never seen that either <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that i that the book thrives on and yeah, they're, they're, that's that, that's uh, baseball right there, right? You can go to the ballpark, you know, all your life. And that next time you go, you're always going to see something that you've never seen before. Bill, what's, what's the, the, the moment that sticks out, uh, you know, in, in you the know, book for in you? Bob's, in Bob's life? No, uh, in the book, in the book. Yeah, no, no. But that's what, I mean, let me just tell you something. I, I, I want to make two things clear. Number one, this is a memoir. And Bob will tell you, it's a memoir of games that Bob has seen. Somebody may have gone to this many games and seen something totally different. Bob was not Zelig. He was not there for every great moment. And we're not giving you every game that he's seen. We've tried to find unique things. And there are some, uh, uh, there are some poignant moments in this. And, uh, uh, Bob, uh, uh, tell Mike about the uh, the Joe Cowley story. Mike, in the uh, final week of 1986, with the Red Sox on the verge of clinching and with the Angels likewise on the verge of clinching the AL West, uh, and we knew what the ALCS was going to be, the Globe sent me out to spend the week in Anaheim to gather material for various feature stories for the uh, preview section that we would put out for the ALCS. And the first day or well, night that I got there, the first get that night, the Angels are playing the White Sox and Joe Cowley is on the mound for the White Sox. And he throws the ugliest, sloppiest, no hitter. It's a one, no hit, one run game. He walked seven, three of which came in the sixth inning preceding a sacrifice fly by Reggie. He threw 138 pitches, you ready? 69 strikes and 69 balls. So right away, this means this is a, a mess yeah. of a no hitter. It's purely circumstantial with line drive outs and the whole package. So, but he throws this game. So after the game, I am back at the hotel having a beer with Ed Sherman of the Chicago Tribune. And who do we see across the bar but Joe Cowley? By himself, which probably told you something, right? And so we go over, chat him up, buy him a beer. And I don't know whether I got him to sign the book then or the next day, but he signs the book. The book is signed. Here's the kicker. 
It was the last game he ever won in the major leagues. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, now, that, you can't Bob, make this S blank, blank, blank up, can you? No. Bob yeah, shared the story it. with me. And I, I have to tell you, to me, it was very moving, the thought of Bob uh, seeing Cowley by himself nursing a beer. Yeah. And so then I start looking him up. And uh, this control problem that he exhibited in the no-hitter was just the start of his troubles. He he lost his next start for the White Sox. He ends up uh, with the Phillies, and he doesn't win a game with them. He gets sent down to the minors, and his control's even worse. He just lost the plate entirely. And the fact is, I would venture to guess, I don't have access to the material, but I would venture to guess that Joel Cowley was the last, the is the only person whose last win was a no-hitter. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably correct and accurate there. That's that's crazy. That's crazy. Again, you know, we talk to, to our coaches here. They're always, well, that's baseball. That's baseball. I mean, baseball, uh, again, Bob, you've covered so many sports. Baseball still has that uniqueness to it, right? Guys, I, I have long been of the opinion. I've written it. I've said it many times over the years there is more conversational fodder in baseball than the other three put together and if you want to throw soccer in there now as a big five uh, fine and 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 no problem i believe that i mean who cares about an offensive lineman what do you say <laughs> what do you say who cares about a a, a a defenseman you know in hockey in terms of you know the the, the fod- it's not nothing to say he's good or he's bad you know i mean it's it no baseball though it, it is the nature of the game and, and, it was, and we have many, you can't make this stuff up moments that are in here, in addition to some very obvious historical you know, or, or, or achievement things that, that uh, any normal fan would appreciate. You know, but, our, but our favorite parts of this book are the things that are, are uh, appealing things to really good fans who appreciate this kind of stuff in baseball. By the way, just, just to add, um, along those lines, uh, we were lucky enough to have Jason Stark join, oh. join us and write the forward. Jason, uh, for somebody like myself who gets lost in, in uh, stats and, and stories, he's obviously a hero. And uh, the fact that, that he contributed was, was really made it special. The cover was designed by Todd Radom. You could see his work all throughout Major League Baseball. He's a gifted designer. Um, and uh, we were lucky. We uh, our our uh, our key point at Triumph Books, a guy by the name of uh, Jesse Jordan. Jordan was just magnificent to us and supportive. And uh, we now share an agent, Andrew Blauner, who helped us through this. It's just, but it's it's we felt surrounded by baseball, and we felt surrounded by having fun. And for me to live through these games through Bob, which is what I hope that readers will do. But more than anything, this was this book there. Uh, the, there's there's no opposition in this. This book is designed for people to have fun. Yeah. You can pick it up anywhere in the book and enjoy it, or you can read it chron- chronologically through but it is for fun. Is there enough for a second edition, a second book? We have two more planned. So (laughs) uh, Mike, if anybody that you know that you can buy this book for will, will keep us as guests on your show. (laughs) There you go. There you go. Well, Bob, as we wrap up here again, uh, you're all over the place. As you said, you're making your appearances on ESPN. How can people follow you, follow what you do in addition to, to this book here? Well, my Twitter handle is at Globe Bob Ryan, and uh, you know, and I'm a frequent tweet. tweet. I'm a, I've come in much being a daily Twitter guy now, so that you can do that. And and uh, uh, my by my email, which is at the bottom of all my columns, so I don't know, is is Robert dot Ryan at Globe dot G L O B E dot com, and I re, I respond to people. I always respond and and uh, welcome you know hearing from from people and, and, and whether it's this or, or whether you want to join me and, and 
railing against the three point shot or you want to chastise me for not getting it because that's that is the bane of my basketball existence and uh, you know i but anyway uh, we'll, we'll we'll table that discussion for another day <laughs> Bill, again, uh, co-writer of this book. What else are you working on? How can people follow you? I know you, you do a lot of stuff with Charlie Snyder with the Dodgers. I'm a Dodger I do. Myself, I do. Uh, I, I prepare game packets for uh, Charlie and the uh, and the Dodgers broadcasters uh, each uh, each game that Charlie works. Uh, every Saturday, I'm in the Chicago Sun-Times. I do a baseball quiz, uh, primarily focused on the Cubs and the White Sox. Uh, in the sports uh, Saturday section, and it is fun, I have to tell you, and uh, uh, and I can uh, I'm I'm helping out uh, 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 the great Joe Poznanski by doing research for him uh, mm-hmm. on a book. And by the way, after you buy our book, uh, you know, buy Joe's okay. the Baseball One Hundred. It's a Absolutely. magnificent book, and then uh, you know, I'm on Twitter every day at Billy Ball. Uh, B-I-L-L-Y-B-A-L-L. Today's uh, uh, tweet was about the fact that Albert Pujols uh, hit two home runs over the weekend, which now gives him five consecutive seasons in which he has one game with two home runs. (laughs) So I'm always looking for odd and unusual things to try and delight Bob Ryan. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I love that. I love the unusual. Again, I, I try to throw some of that stuff into my broadcast as well. So I can certainly appreciate that. That's a good one with the, with pull holes there. But fellas, this has been uh, very enjoyable. I wish you guys uh, lots of luck with the book. Hope that, uh, uh, again, you, you have a lot of success with these next ed- editions coming out as well. I'm looking forward to going and get my copy. And uh, again, see what I can learn from that as well. Like you said, it's scoring a game is, is something everybody does. Everyone has their own style to it. But it's it's so unique and so great to, to be able to go and do that and, and a great way to enjoy this great game of baseball. Thank you so much. You are a great host. Thanks a lot, Mike. Well, great stuff there from Bob Ryan and Bill Chuck. You could tell those guys get along well and uh, author a great book, In Scoring Position, out now from Triumph Books. And we thank Triumph Books for helping arrange that interview. Scott King as well for bringing us all together for that one. That one certainly fun. Make sure you get that book. And we thank you once again, as always, for joining us here today. That was episode number 30. Can you believe it? 30 more to come, at least. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You don't want to miss out. Always get notified when we have a new episode coming out. We'll have those shortly as well. We thank you for joining us once again in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Have a great day, everybody.